Hello, welcome to NPTEL NOC, an introductory course on point set topology, part two, module four. So in past three modules, we have been preparing for proof of implicit and inverse function theorem. Last time we also saw the statement of the implicit function theorem. So let me just uh, recall the statement again. I have explained the statement last time. So let me just recall this one now only. V and W are Banach spaces. Y is any topological space. M cross N B an open subset of Y cross V and a function capital F from M cross N to W, which is continuous. Then it satisfies three more conditions. What are they? For some point Y naught V naught inside M cross N, F of Y naught V naught is zero. For each Y inside M, the function Fy, which sends V to capital Fyv, that is differentiable as a function from N to W, and this derivative for each y I have, so derivative function from m cross n to b v w that is continuous. And the derivative at y naught v naught, namely g y naught v naught is similarity between v and w. Okay, in particular, v and w are similar. Okay, Banach spaces, isometric Banach spaces. Then there exists rho positive and an open neighborhood M prime of Y naught inside M and a function G from the closed ball of radius rho around V naught. Okay, oh, sorry, from M prime to the closed ball such that f of y g y is 0. Moreover, this function g from m prime to b rho, b rho bar v naught is continuous. This is the first conclusion. The second conclusion, conclusion b here, requires one more hypothesis, namely, assume y is also a Banach space and the function restricted to y not v naught from this m to w namely f y v naught operating upon y is just capital f of y v naught this is differentiable at y naught and its derivative is h then g will be differentiable at y naught and the derivative of g is given by minus t inverse h okay so let us start uh, proving this one now there are a number of steps to be taken so that we understand what is going on so the proof is broken up into smaller steps the first step is i want to make a simplification in the statement as well as in the proof Namely, I would like to bring this T to be identity map. How can I do that? Namely, by composing with T inverse from with W and as if we are working now all the time inside V. Okay, compose T inverse. Don't go to V at all, W at all. Keep coming into V. That means you can assume that V and W are actually the same space instead of similarity so how do how this is what i want to do so how do i do that so as follows namely put f hat replace f by f hat which is t inverse of f remember f was from m cross v m cross n to w now it will be n cross n to v itself Okay, so that's all. Now, suppose we have proved this theorem. 
to f hat okay in this special case then we can go back to uh, the original by, by pre again composing by t okay so if we replace f by f, f hat then the derivative of this one will be now t t inverse into t which is the identity at the point y not v not okay because the derivative of a linear uh, automorphism whatever it is is itself when you by by composition law by by chain rule derivative of this f uh, uh, t inverse composite f will be t inverse composite derivative of f so that will be identity so this is what we want to uh, assume so that writing down the proof will become easier i don't have to keep on writing t here that's all no? okay so that is the first step all right maybe we will do use this one only for a as soon as we have proved it for this special case we know that it is true for the general case also because all that i have to do is apply the same thing T composite that thing to get back to our F. Okay. In the step two, now we have the modified hypothesis. Okay. All one, two, three are all modified. Namely, this now W is V itself. So M cross V to V, we have got a function instead of m cross v to w okay so i am writing m cross v to v now you take the function new function s defined by s of y v equal to v minus f of y v f is a function from m cross n to w okay so define s of y v equal to v minus f of y v okay for every point, see f is defined earlier, f was defined from m cross n. So, so this function will be defined on now m cross n again. Okay. For every point, 0 less than for every epsilon between 0 and 1, let us have this short notation instead of writing all the times minimum of epsilon and half okay c epsilon we claim that there exists an open set m prime such that y naught is inside m prime contained inside m and a positive row such that s restricted to the fun uh, restricts to a function from m prime cross the closed ball goes inside the closed ball and satisfies this inequality. This is our first step. Part of this, remember, is existence of this M prime and rho. This was a part of A, right? But the conclusion is slightly, you know, in between conclusion. It's a weaker conclusion. We are not yet saying that there is a unique G and etc. G hasn't yet appeared. The first thing is the new function S has this property, namely S of yv1 minus S of yv2 is less than C epsilon times v1 minus v2 for every y in m prime. v1 and v2 are inside the closed ball. Remember, this was nothing but a uniform contraction. So, so we are up to now applying contraction mapping, which was done in the first module. Remember that, right? So first we have to claim this one. So first let us get the proof of this part. Okay. So that is the, okay. So how to prove this one? G of Y naught V naught is identity now, right? Earlier it was just a, Similarity t in the new hypothesis is identity. 
by continuity of g we first select a neighborhood m prime of y and a rho positive such that g y v minus identity is less than c epsilon so this is where the continuity of the derivative in the second variable that is used okay this g was the differentiation of capital f right with respect to the second variable v so by continuity of this some neighborhood of y not and some neighborhood of v not will go inside that in the neighborhood of v not i can choose to be a uh, open ball of course i can take it smaller than then i can take the closed ball also no problem but for m prime for neighborhood of y not y is some arbitrary space so just some neighborhood i don't have any balls there yet okay for every y comma v inside m prime cross system this is true now use the continuity of f v not we can replace m prime by a smaller neighborhood if necessary so that f of y v not is less than rho time rho by 2 for every y inside m prime so there is a choice of m prime at the second stage first stage is some m prime that is replaced by smaller m prime this m prime will depend upon the rho the rho is chosen in the first instance then i am choosing m prime in a smaller than that okay so m choice of m prime will depend upon the rho to so make it less than rho by 2 see here if i had kept original t then i had to write a norm of t in our here okay so i have i have this becomes easier because just rho by 2 i can just get all right next i come to take a fix take some point m prime m, y in m prime okay m prime has been cut down neatly now put sy of v could s of yv remember what was s of yv s of yv is by definition is v minus f of yv okay so so now i am just writing this sy of v wherein thinking this as a function of v y is fixed s of yv now the derivative of s of y with respect to v is nothing but you see v der derivative is identity this part is the f this is g g of y v prime okay i am just using this formula this definition here if the derivative of this one is identity minus derivative of f all right so identity minus g of y v prime therefore the norm of this Which is less than equal to norm of identity minus g of this one. That is less than equal to c epsilon. C g minus identity less than equal to c epsilon. That is fourteen. That is the choice of m prime here. You get the first choice. Second choice is smaller than so that is also valid for that. Okay, so I have this one less than equal to identity minus. So c epsilon. It's less than good half because c epsilon is minimum of epsilon and half for every y and v prime belonging to m prime cross the closed ball b rho v prime. Okay, once the derivative is less than to half, we know that s y of v two minus s y of v one is less than or equal to this constant lambda one by two times v two minus v one. Okay. right so this is the mean value theorem that you have proved i mean mean value inequality for every y v prime belong to m prime cross b rho bar of v not so what is this one this constant is less than 1 therefore this is a contraction mapping okay in order to apply the contraction mapping principle 
we have yet to show that this SY takes the closed ball inside the closed ball. Then the closed ball in a Banach space is a complete metric space on its own. Then we can apply contraction mapping. Okay. So next step we have to do this one. So here I have made a remark. The choice of M prime depends upon rho. Okay. So we can see that because in the second step here we have already chosen rho and now we are using the, uh, the continuity of this fp prime the second in the second slot to make it as the second the first slot smaller the second slot is fixed here as a function of y it has become smaller that's all okay so we have to prove that the closed ball goes inside the closed ball under sy okay so that we can think of sy as a contraction mapping inside this metric space which is a complete metric space so why this is true take any v such that norm of v minus v naught is less than or equal to rho that means a point of the ball then sy of v minus v naught i should say that this is also less than or equal to rho so that will prove this statement so i am looking at the norm of this one now here you add and subtract sy of v minus sy of v naught minus sy of v naught what it is this minus 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 v naught huh so sy of v minus sy of v naught plus this is f of y v naught okay so f of y v naught look at this, this definition f is sy okay minus this one this is minus of minus that will be plus nor when you take they are the same f of y v naught is this okay we bring at this one this one on this side so v minus this one okay what I'm saying here, S of Y V naught here, F Y V naught minus V will be equal to F of Y V naught with a negative sign. The norm will be the same. Okay. So, this norm we have seen is already less than equal to V minus V naught by 2. And this norm is less than equal to rho rho by 2. So that is the second choice here. Where is the second choice that we have made here? f of y v naught norm is less than rho by 2. Okay. So rho by 2, rho by 2 is less than equal to, I mean, some of this one is less than rho. Okay. Started with V minus V naught is less than or equal to rho here. So norm of V minus V naught by 2 is rho by 2. Okay, so what we have proved is that S Y for each Y, fixed Y, is a contraction mapping of the closed ball V bar rho V naught. Okay. So, now we can come to the proof of the statement A, that is the step 3. V is a Banach space. Every closed ball in it is a complete metric space. Therefore, by step 2, we can apply a contraction mapping theorem to conclude that SY has a unique fixed point. We define G by M prime to G is M prime to M prime is the points where in y varies right into b bar rho by the formula sy of gy is gy okay so fixed point of sy for each y there is only one unique map that is important there is one unique uh, point inside this ball by definition sy of v this is equal to saying that fy gy is zero 
because s y of uh, v is nothing but v minus f of v s v right so f of y g y is 0 will be s of y will be v so it follows that for each y in m prime g y is unique okay for each y in m prime g y is unique that is the uh, conclusion of the contraction mapping in particular g y not has to be v not because y not is already going to v not under f y f of v not y uh, y not v not is zero that was the high starting hypothesis so g of y not has to be v not the continuity of g is a direct consequence of part b of the contraction mapping theorem which we approved in the first part in the uh, in the first module okay is, is sy is continuous in y then this is continuous was following that that is what we have proved that one. so this proves part a all right proof of part b since now we now assume that y is a banach space second part we may assume that m prime is a convex neighborhood of uh, of uh, this y naught of this y naught in both is 14 and 15 right in the beginning you can assume this is uh, convex in smaller things also you can choose again convex set so here in these two okay so choice of m prime being convex doesn't make sense in an op or arbitrary topological space. So we couldn't have said right here. But the once we know that y is a Banach space, we can make this one a convex set also. Okay, convex neighborhood of the point y naught. So having made that demand on m prime, let us continue now for the proof of this part. Okay, here. Okay. By theorem 1.21, now because of convexity, along with this uh, hypothesis 14, what happens? F of y v minus f of y v naught minus v minus v naught. See, there was a t here. Now, t is identity. It's less than it to C epsilon times V minus V naught for every Y V in M prime cross B bar of rho. Okay. So this was the mean value in equality. Okay. We have proved this theorem 1.21. Y belonging to M prime put V equal to GY in this formula. Then f of y g y minus f of y v naught minus v is g y right g y minus v naught is less than to c epsilon times g y minus v naught. Therefore, f of y v naught plus g y is minus f of y v g y plus plus v naught is there. So I am taking only this part now f of y v naught plus g y minus v naught is less than equal to c epsilon times g y minus v naught. Why? Because f of y g y is 0. So, because I am taking a norm, I can convert all these negative signs into positive sign. Okay. This minus sign will become plus, this plus sign will become minus sign. So f of y g y is 0 by choice of g y. Okay. So part b of theorem 1.1, namely the continuity part, taking f equal to s and v equal to g, we get g y minus v naught is less than or equal to distance between g y and v naught, which is distance between g y what is v naught is g y naught 
that is less than to 1 divided by 1 minus epsilon see i am going to use the full statement of part p of theorem 1.1 which i have told you namely the inequality that we have established there norm of gy minus v naught we didn't write it in the terms of norm but we didn't write it in the matrix notation is gy v naught which is gy g g v naught this was less than or equal to 1 divided by 1 minus epsilon distance between gy and s of y v naught now go back figure this distance is uh, given by the metric here uh, this metric is given by the norm here so i can replace it by norm so 1 divided by 1 minus c epsilon gy minus s of y v naught okay but this is by definition f of y v naught definition of s okay now you use the fact that c epsilon is the minimum of epsilon and 1 by 2 so it is less than equal to 1 by 2 so, so this 1 divided by 1 minus epsilon is less than equal to 2 okay so this whole thing is less than equal to twice f of y v naught therefore go back now g y minus v naught plus f of y v naught Okay, that will be less than twice C epsilon times F of Y. All that we want is some constant here. Okay, it depends upon C. It may be three times, may be four times, that doesn't matter. Okay, so let us write F of Y V naught as H of Y naught V naught times operating upon y minus v naught plus the remainder why we can write it as because this is the derivative of f okay with respect to the y coordinate v naught is fixed here okay y minus y naught i am taking because it's the derivative with respect to the uh, y coordinate here so r y r y is the remainder after uh, n terms after our first term this has a property that Ry divided by norm of y minus y naught tends to 0 as y tends to 0. Okay. So I am using the increment theorem here. Therefore, if you use this in, in this uh, inequality that we have established, what we get is gy minus v naught plus h of y naught v naught minus y y minus y naught this term okay so i replace f by this plus this one so g y minus v naught plus this term is f y minus r y so this term i have taken is g y minus v naught is as it is this term is replaced by f y minus r y okay but this part we have already shown twice c epsilon plus f y v naught therefore i can add plus norm of r y this is triangle inequality okay this term is less than equal to this term plus this term c twice c epsilon f y v naught norm plus norm of r y but that is same thing as now we go back f y v naught is this plus this so h of y naught v naught y minus y naught plus twice c epsilon plus one plus one more here this twice c epsilon it comes from here and one here one extra term comes from here so this much plus into r y okay dividing out by y minus y naught the y minus y naught term comes from here norm this is a linear map, right? So, norm of this is less than equal to norm of this into norm of y minus v naught. Okay, you divide out by this, take the limit, what we get? This divided by, take divided by y minus y naught, take the limit. This is just zero because this is the derivative of this one. Okay, so we get gy minus v naught 
plus h of this y minus v naught equal y minus y naught as y tends to this one okay is less than or equal to you see epsilon twice epsilon y minus v naught y this is there plus r y is there divided by y minus y naught this tends to zero no i mean doesn't matter what this constant is right so this part vanishes this part will remain okay but it is twice c epsilon times norm of h y h y not v not the norm of y y minus y not term cancels out okay so i repeat when you take the limit this term vanishes because r y divided by y minus y not tends to zero With this term y minus norm of y minus y not comes out and that has gone down you are divided so that term remains okay so this is true for all epsilon positive right that's what i told some c epsilon twice three times whatever you don't care so we get that for every epsilon i have taken c epsilon to be minimum of epsilon and half okay so if this is true then this left hand side limit must be zero what is this this limit tells you that g is differentiable at v not with h as its derivative that's the definition of differentiation sorry minus h as the derivative there is a plus sign here okay so this completes the proof of part b and thereby completes the proof of the implicit function theorem i recall that in the original statement there was a t inverse here but now in the in the modified statement we have made t to be identity map that's why the t doesn't appear here okay so that is the proof of implicit function theorem now let us go to inverse function theorem there is one step ahead but this is the crux of the fact this is the main thing that we want to prove finally v and w are banach spaces u is an open subset of the first banach space v f is a function from this open set into w the condition on f is that its continuously differentiable function and its derivative at a particular point v not is a similarity okay the conclusion is that there exists a neighborhood of v not such that f on that neighborhood to its image is a homeomorphism fn is open in w moreover f inverse is also continuously differentiable so starting with just a continuously differentiable function which is such that at one point the derivative is invertible in a small neighborhood the function itself is a homeomorphism actually a diffeomorphism because inverse is also continuously differentiable moreover on to the image is also open both n and fn are open n is open in v and fn is open in v the hypothesis that f df v not is similarity automatically implies that v and w are similar spaces okay so how do we prove that since the set of all similarities from one vector space to one banach space to another banach space is an open subset okay of the continuous linear maps from v to w all continuous maps invertible maps are an open set this is what we have seen 
df from u to bvw is given to be continuous okay by replacing u by a smaller neighborhood of v0 if necessary we can assume that df v is similar for all v inside u okay all that i have made is you know the map is continuous okay df and at v0 it goes to a similarity and similarity is contained inside an open subset here we have denoted by a a v w so you take an open subset going inside that by continuity and that open subset let us now rewrite it as u we don't want the bigger u at all so the assumption is that starting with one as one at one point it is invertible we are assuming that for all v inside u df v is invertible is a similarity okay next step in the implicit function theorem above we take y equal to w okay so we are in the part b already remember part b of implicit function theorem wanted us to be that y to be a banach space so we are taking much special case y as the w itself okay take y not as f of v not v not is given now what is y not don't worry worry about other points take y not f of v not now you take capital f from w to u w cross u to w in fact some neighborhood of of y not and v not i should take to w but i can define it this map from the whole of w cross u to w given by f of w v is w minus f v very simple function okay capital f this is what we are going to apply the implicit function theorem for then f is continuously differentiable as a function of v that's what we wanted first of all in fact this is continuously differentiable even in terms of w also so all the hypotheses that we needed are satisfied for each w inside w the derivative of this function namely when w is fixed v going to f of w is minus of df and minus of df at v not is a similarity so all the hypotheses of implicit function theorem are satisfied the first part says there is a neighborhood m prime of w of f v not and a row positive such that for each w inside m prime there is a unique g w uh, there i put to y y y and so on now y is w so i am writing plus g w belonging to b row bar such that f of w g w is zero but what is f of g w w g w it is w minus f of g w w minus f of v right v is g w so what is the meaning of this this just means that f g is identity on m prime right so that is the meaning of this one moreover the part a already tells you that this map g from m prime to b bar is a unique one and part b says it is continuously differentiable at it's continuous on the whole of it sorry is differentiable at w not the second part says it is differentiable at w not the first part says it is continuous okay not continuous differentiable sorry that is not correct so that is what we have so this is all the implicit function theorem applied to this special case okay so are we through so we have to see what is really happening here the existence of g implies 
This M prime is inside the image of F. Image of F restricted to the closed ball. See what is it means? There exists for each, each. See map is from M prime F. F is a map from V to some neighborhood of, right? So something inside W, but I want to say that M prime is covered by F. Each point M prime, namely W, there is a point here which we call the GW. F of that is M prime. F of that is W. So this means that M is contained inside the image of F or image of B bar under F. Okay. That is the meaning of the existence. Therefore, what we take is N to be this open ball intersection with F inverse of M prime. M prime is an open set, open set. So F inverse of M prime is an open set. Intersect with the open ball that is an open subset of V. Clearly, it is a neighborhood of V naught because V naught is inside F inverse of M. Okay. F of V naught is our uh, starting point, this uh, Y naught or W naught, whatever. Okay. So, this is a neighborhood of V naught. The uniqueness of G implies that this map now restricted to N from N to Fn is a bijection because F composite G is identity. We told you that G is the left inverse of F or F is the right inverse of G. Okay. But now G is unique. Okay, so F must be injective also. So F is a bijection with G as its inverse. Okay. Why not? So I have already told you that V naught is inside N and N is open inside V. F from N to Fn is a homeomorphism. But why Fn is open but Fn happens to be just G inverse of M prime. Because G composite F is identity. Okay. So, Fn is also an open subset. Of course, it is a neighborhood of Fv naught. Okay. So, here is the <laughs> picture I have drawn. V to W, this F is a multivalued function. It is not, it is not assumed to be uh, one one map or anything. There is no need for that. Okay. So, what we started? We started with a neighborhood M prime and a neighborhood B rho bar here of corresponding neighborhood. Okay. For each point in M prime, there is a unique G inside this ball. Okay. What is the F of that is back to M prime here. Is W. So go G and come back by F. F of composite G is the identity map of this part, which means that this M prime is covered by the image of this one. This is some larger thing. Okay, if you take F of this, it could be larger. It covers M prime. Okay, but for points of M prime inside this one, there is only one point which is coming to that. That is the that is the uniqueness part of this. Okay, if there are another point here coming here, the uniqueness will fail. Right? But some point here may come here. Some point may here may come here. I don't care. Inside this ball, open ball, there is only one G. Okay. So therefore, when you take this M prime and inverse of that, okay, inside this one, there may be some other point. I am intersecting it be in the open ball. That is what I am calling it as N. On N to M prime, F is a bijection now. And its inverse is G. Okay. And what we know is that G is differentiable at V naught here. Sorry, 
F V naught here. This is W naught. Okay, G is continuous. F is continuous. They are inverses of each other. Homeomorphism. N is open. M prime is open. But I am not taking the whole of M prime here. What I am taking is F of N. Okay, F of N is open. All right, F of N is also a neighborhood of F V naught. So only thing that remains is why this G is differentiable on the whole of N. We know it only at one point, right? What is that point? That point was an arbitrary point of this neighborhood. Okay, the hypothesis is true now for the, all of the points in N. Remember, that was the starting point of our choice of the neighborhood here. Okay, for all, uh, we cut down the neighborhood U itself such that DF is invertible on all the whole of this. So that hypothesis is there. Therefore, for every point V prime here, I can apply the same theorem to conclude that the inverse exists in some neighborhood, the inverse being a unique map, okay, and it will be differentiable at f of v prime. But inside this neighborhood, g has to be the same map because it has to be the inverse of f. Because f is already one one map. Therefore, g is differentiable at all the points of fn. fn. Starting with any point here, the, the same hypothesis is applicable here. Okay. So, this is the last thing I repeat here. So far, we had only proved that G is differentiable at FV naught. But then the same argument applied at each point W prime is FV prime. Where V prime ranges over N will tell you that in some smaller neighborhood, all that is there in the background, we can ignore them. F V prime contained inside F of N, everything, F is a continuous uh, inverse which is differentiable at F of V prime. F has a continuous inverse that, but continuous inverse, well, inverse itself is the same G now. There is no other because F is already one one map. But the inverse of F has to be G on all of F N. Therefore, G is differentiable at F on the whole of F. Okay. So, final thing is that if you take G composite F, which is identity, so its derivative is also identity, right? Identity equal to D of G composite F, but all the points U, but by chain rule, this is dg at f u composite with d f at u which implies if these two functions one is composite other is identity dg of f u is nothing but f u d f u inverse okay and that is equal to by definition of our eta eta of DFU. Okay. Therefore, the continuity of this DG okay, follows from the assumption that DF is continuous and the fact that eta is continuous. Okay. As seen in theorem 1.14. Therefore, the derivative is continuous. See, Till here we only show that G is differentiable. If DG is continuous, follows, but DG is given by, by this formula, namely it is TF inverse. So I said this is the inverse of this one. But this is also true for if you take D of F composite G, F composite G is all right identity. So it's both ways. Therefore, one is the inverse of the other. 
okay the inverse taking inverse itself is a continuous operation therefore we have that dg as a continuous function okay so that completes the argument completes all the proofs of all the assertions of uh, the inverse function theorem so so theorem 1.14 is proved so that's all today so let us stop here